Lee, the father of Full Contact. Hello, this is Joe Lewis doing your commentary. What you're about to witness here is history in the making. This fight coming up took place Long Beach, California, February 1970. This happens to be the very first Full Contact match ever in this entire hemisphere. The reason I say was Bruce Lee the father of Full Contact is because he was my instructor. He had worked with me a couple years prior to this match. Unfortunately, several months just before this match, we weren't allowed to work together. I had no trainer. I had no sparring partners. So I came into this match basically all alone. I was working out at Mr. Chuck Norris's karate school. Mr. Bob Wall had given me a key. I went down there every morning at 7 o'clock, work on the heavy bag, and then I did the road work later in the afternoon. As you can see here, the match is getting on the way. Mr. Greg Baines from Northern California, I considered at that time to be the best heavyweight in the United States, if not in the entire world. You can tell his back is very broad. He had beat just about everybody. This is the first time he and I were able to get together. You see the double right hook coming up there? That was one of the moves that Mr. Bruce Lee had showed me. I try to use this move quite, quite often in my training against a heavy bag, and it proved to be the successful winning combination as you will see coming up in round number two. That's Mr. Steve Armstrong from Tacoma, Washington in the background. He's our referee at that point. We clashed a lot here. We did a lot of inside fighting. The inside fighting seemed to be to my advantage. In those days you were able to jam up the full contact fighters kicks who were basically point fighters converting over into full contact coming across with hand combinations on the inside. As you just saw there with my right hook. You see my head moving a little bit, but unfortunately in those days, my strategy wasn't that good. Bruce Lee was a principle-centered trainer. In other words, he stressed quite a number of principles, such as good, strong positioning, being able to bridge the gap fast, being explosive off that initial move, working quite a bit on mobility, which you see me moving there. Unfortunately, I didn't move quite enough, especially on the inside the mobility proves to serve to your advantage. There I'm coming in with a sidekick and keeping your opponent from firing, hitting you on the inside, keeping him off balance. There you see Mr. Baines coming in swing a little while. Unfortunately, he would fire one punch and his other hand would drop down. Mr. Armstrong stepping there and breaking us up. Actually, judging from the physical conditioning of both of us, you can imagine what it would be like to be in a clinch with either one of us at that particular time. The injury level here is soaring in this particular match. There it ends the first round. I go over. This is Mr. Jim Harrison from Kansas City. Currently lives in Montana. Stepping in, he was my cornerman. Mr. Harrison and I fought about six months after this match in Dallas, Texas, in the very first United States title fights in full contact. Mr. Harrison knocked out Mr. Vic Moore at that time as a middleweight, and I won the uh, first. United States Headweight Championship, myself, beating a Mr. Ed Daniels, fortunately a good friend of mine at that particular time. You note also in this particular match, I was wearing sneakers. Mr. Greg Baines chose to come in there wearing uh, nothing on his feet. Mr. Baines at that time was a uh, black Muslim. That was a pretty strong movement at that time. If you remember the 1970 Mexico Olympics, and he and his Muslim friends did their little orientation just prior to this match. Here at the beginning of the second round, we're squaring off, sizing each other up. I'm trying to work that forehand strike that Bruce Lee had showed me, trying to maintain the distance. Faint upstairs, come in downstairs. There it seemed to look like I walked into a left hook by Mr. Greg Baines, but he wasn't really sitting down on those punches. He wasn't really getting his weight behind those techniques. 
There I'm working my double right hook. Again, that proved to be very successful. Bruce Lee taught me how to put substance into my techniques. As you'll see the winning combination getting ready to come up. I'm stepping in, I'm gonna fire a right hook downstairs as I go downstairs, come back upstairs with the right hook. Referee stepped in front of the punch. I thought he was playing possum here at this moment. I stepped in, finish him off with the right hand. Step back, I'm jubilant here. I'm not sure if he's gonna get up or not. I thought he's playing possum up there against the ropes. Unfortunately, if I'd let him go, he'd have probably fallen down anyway. He fails to get to his feet, and here I successfully win the very first full contact match ever. And I'm quite happy about it. I'm not quite sure, and I didn't realize at this point that history was actually being made. And those of you watching this particular match, you're seeing a first, an absolute first. This is the first time this had ever taken place. And fortunately enough, we do have it on record. That's Mr. Pat Burleson from Fort Worth, Texas, one of the early referees stepping into the ring. I received a standing ovation. You can't see the audience in the background. There's a number of people down from the Hollywood scene here. I'm going over now telling Mr. Harrison that right hook was the one that helped me win this particular victory there. Poor unfortunate Mr. Greg Baines didn't realize where he was. Six months later, I think he was in an automobile accident and ended his career. Otherwise, we'd be hearing quite a bit about Mr. Greg Baines even to this day. Mr. Steve Armstrong stepped up over there, consoling him, telling him the fight is over. As you know, a lot of times when a person is knocked out, they keep asking over and over and over again, what happened, what happened, what happened? And regardless of how many times you tell them, hey, you got knocked out, you got knocked out, they can't seem to remember anything. Mr. Bob Wall, Chuck Norris, myself, Skipper Mullins, and Mike Stone had earlier fought on a team match. I was a little tired at the beginning of this fight. However, right now I'm full of energy. I'm on top of the world at this point. I didn't quite realize what I was actually into. I'm going to be showing you now some of the techniques, some of the principles which Bruce Lee had showed me, which helped me to come to victory in this very first full contact match ever. Hello, I'm Joe Lewis. I'd like to talk with you just a little bit about my relationship with Bruce Lee, where we met, what took place in our workouts, what was it like to work with Mr. Bruce Lee, and then what to look forward to on the rest of this tape. Now, very important in working with Bruce Lee is this, his philosophy. Most martial artists do not have a philosophy, a philosophy of training, a philosophy about their techniques, or what we call a strategic philosophy. Why is that important in going into a fight? I was basically taught this implicitly working with most of the Bruce Lee. When you get ready to go into a fight, one of the most important things is to begin a fight, you need good technique. Good technique will help you to start a fight. Number two, you need guts. You need that physical conditioning to be able to hang in there, to stay in there. So that's the second factor. And this is the third factor which I got working with Mr. Bruce Lee. And we don't see it a lot in a number of other martial arts styles. Number three, you need heart. The most important thing about a fight is not winning and losing, but being able to finish the fight. And to be able to finish the fight, you need that spiritual philosophy, like the one I was taught in Okinawa, never quit. Be first, be quick, and don't stop. Most people aren't able to finish the fight because they lack heart. So whenever you make a movement, like some of the movies you're gonna be seeing on this tape, like the lead hand punch, the lead leg sidekick, Bruce Lee always taught me, always put your heart into it. Now going back to the original point here, philosophy. Philosophy was a very imperative part of what Bruce Lee was teaching me. Now I made some brief notes here because over the years a number of people have been asking me many, many, many different questions about Mr. Bruce Lee and the Jeet Kune Do style. He was a principle-centered person. That means when he taught me to throw punches, taught me to throw kicks, don't throw blanks. Put some emotion into it. Put some feeling into it. And that's one reason why a number of people quit the martial arts or fade out or get out of shape. Because they don't really get in touch with their emotional self when they're out there executing techniques, executing punches. For example, when you throw a punch, like the forehand strike Bruce Lee showed me. First time you throw that punch, you throw it real fast. Just let your opponent know, hey, I'm fast. Next time you come back to fire that punch, you throw it exceptionally fast. Just let the man know, hey, I can hit you. 
Next time you come back, pow, you hit him again. Boom, double up on him, let him know, hey, not only can I hit you, but I can hit you twice. Next time you start putting a real intent onto it. So not only are you letting your opponent know, hey, I can hit you, boom, but I can also blister you, boom, I can hurt you. So you learn to communicate with your opponent with these punches and these kicks. And that was a very integral part of this whole Jeet Kune Do system. Your emotional gratification as you're working out, as you're executing your punches and kicks. Without this, Jeet Kune Do, I don't think, would work. So Bruce Lee had a way of igniting that emotional gratification within me. And I would usually say something like, what we call the power of a principle-centered fighter. And listen to what I'm saying. What do you call the power of a principle-centered fighter? Basically, that is the overall general theme which permeates the entire Jeet Kune Do system. In a way, what Bruce Lee was showing us was basically organized common sense. Now, the key to Bruce Lee's, Bruce Lee's system is there was a strong network of philosophy interwoven in the basic structure of what Bruce Lee was all about and what Jeet Kune Do was all about. In other words, most styles lack this basic innate structure. Now, over the years, as I was working with Bruce Lee, um, I was able to gradually integrate what he was teaching me and come up with my own basic philosophy as I'll be talking about some of this as we go on with the tape. Let me go back and brief you a little bit about the first time I met Bruce Lee. I was over at Black Belt Magazine back in the 60s. As a matter of fact, the year was 1967. I just came out of, I had just come out of rather Black Belt Magazine over in Washington Boulevard and Bruce Lee was in there doing something. He came outside and confronted me in the parking lot and I didn't know who he was because I never watched Green Hornet series. And he came up and he started talking to me about Jeet Kune Do, uh, some of the Wing Chun movements, some of the sticky hand techniques, why in his style, unlike most traditional martial artists, they stand with their power side back to the rear. He would take the power side, which in my case would be my right side, and show me why you should put the right side forward. And I got a little confused here because back in those days, I didn't have a lot of respect for little guys. And if you were under five foot eight, in my book, you were little. And if you were under 150 pounds, in my book, you were little. Plus, most of the Chinese styles weren't into fighting, weren't into the combat aspect of it, like the Muay Thai fighters or the point fighters of today. And I just had sort of a recalcitrant attitude. At that time, I didn't really respect authority and had sort of an ambivalent feeling about the uh, wushu types of fighting, such as what Bruce Lee, uh, in my eye, had come from. So I got sort of turned off to him initially. The next time he and I met was in the Mayflower Hotel up in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Jun Ree, who was the promoter in the United States National Championships in those days, invited me, Robert Culp, and Bruce Lee uh, to be sp uh, the special guest. I was the defending champion of the United States National Championships that year. Uh, to participate as guest uh, at the 1967 championships. At the Mayflower Bruce, uh, Hotel, Bruce Lee came up to me in the lobby, introduced himself. Again, I didn't know who he was, but he was very cordial, very nice, always dressed exceptionally well, and a very war friendly person. And at that time, I started to uh, take a little more of a liking to him. My partner at that time was Mr. Bob Wall, who a lot of you know from the uh, uh, Enter the Dragon uh, film, and uh, Bob and I talked about him a little bit at that time. Later on, Mr. Bob Wall, myself, and the first superstar in the martial arts, Mr. Mike Stone, put together a nightclub act. This was in later 1967. And uh, as we were going around to different nightclubs, at the end of these nightclub acts that Mr. Wall and Mike Stone and I would be into, we would go outside and we would start talking about different things. And Mike Stone started talking to me about this exceptional martial artist named Bruce Lee and how exceptional these new movements he uh, was teaching Mike were working for him. And so Mike Stone was really the one who convinced me that I should reconsider uh, Bruce Lee's approach to me because Bruce Lee came to me and asked me uh, to allow him to teach me. At that time, I was already an amateur world champion. I was the United States national champion. I was on my way to becoming uh, a three-time international champion. And so 
I got back in touch with Mr. Lee, and we started working together. I worked with him about once a week. I would go over to his house, and this is how it was. He lived in Culver City. I'd knock on the door. He'd be waiting for me. I, I was usually a little late, and he'd get on my case about being late a little bit. And we'd, we'd go inside, and one of the first things he would do is he would show me his form. He always worked on his form, and he was really impressed with my muscles, so he's always trying to show me how strong his form. He'd tell me to fill his form. Then he'd pull up his shirt, and he'd show me his midsection and say, fill my stomachs and stomach muscles, and he was very impressed with the fact he was trying to develop a little six-pack down there, six-packs where you see the, the three different rolls of muscles, three on each side. And then he always had some new kick that he was working on, so he would lift his leg out and he'd fire a sidekick or something, he'd hold his leg out and he'd say, okay, Mr. Lewis, what do you think, what do you think? Like a little kid, he's very charming, very intelligent, very creative. Then we'd go through the workout. I never sparred Mr. Lee. There have been some rumors out there that Mr. Lee and I had sparred. We never sparred. Close to wherever I came to sparring, one time I went over to his house, Mr. Ted Wong was one of the kids he was working with at that time, and we put on the uh, helmets and the uh, kendo gloves and Bruce Lee had me fire a forehand strike at him. So I fired it at him. He sort of slipped off the side, but I was getting pretty quick in those days. Then he asked me to fire it again. I fired again. His timing wasn't quite there yet. Then the third time I fired it, he slipped to the side and came back with a triple counterpoint. Pow, pow, pow. Kind of smile, took his helmet off. And that was the closest we ever really came to sparring. We would do drills where we would square off in front of each other. I'd fire a sidekick at him, he'd fire a sidekick back at me, back forth, back forth working on different types of either timing, distancing drills, or bridging the gap drills, or what have you. But we never actually sparred. There were some inconsistencies in the Jit Kune Do system. Now, I plan to get into these in my uh, a second part two tape on this. But basically, the inconsistencies which I differed were in the Jit Kune Do style, they did a lot of trapping movements. And when you do the trapping movements, the shoulders tend to be squared off with your opponent, the way you would run against a lineman in football, instead of the shoulder being perpendicular to your opponent. When your shoulders are like this, you know in wrestling, all a person has to do is push or pull you and you're off balance. Plus, he was always talking about your center line must be closed. Your face, your solar plexus, your groin, that center line must be closed at all times. And so I felt the center line was always open, and there was sort of a contradiction there, what he was trying to tell us and when they did the stick hand. So what you're going to be seeing on this tape is a simplified version of the Jit Kune Do that I felt actually worked. And so I cut out a lot of the things which I didn't feel were really relevant. Um, Jit Kune Do is an integration of many martial arts, always changing. And what I want you to think about here is Part of being a good teacher is to be able to go out and teach what you've learned or to be able to go out and practice what you've learned. And although Bruce Lee did not want me showing anyone his material, I felt like it was very imperative for me to work with another sparring partner. And I hope you enjoy this tape. Thank you. All right, at this point, I want to gradually start showing you some of the moves that Bruce Lee worked with me on specifically. I'm going to rush through this and the transition that's going to take place in the next 30 minutes perhaps took place over a period of uh, four to six months of Bruce and I working together. Basically he would show me some drills and I would go and work on it for a week. I'd come back, he'd show me something else, so forth and so on. One of the first things I want to point out is let's pick it up in terms of what my style looked like at the time Bruce and I actually started meeting. All right, now zoom back and watch my stance here. In the old days, I used to fight like this. In Okinawa, I learned to fight with my right side forward. As I fought with my right side forward, I would have one hand in front of my rib cage like so, one hand down along my side, like this, protecting my side. And we concentrate a lot on front hand strikes to the face like this, and a lead off side kick off the front leg, so stepping up this way, folding the knee and just locking it straight in. Sometimes we would step behind and lock it straight in at our opponent. So a lot of what Bruce Lee did was, in the beginning he did start copying my fighting stance, which he thought looked pretty theatrical and it did for film work. Uh, I switched, when I came over from Okinawa, switched from fighting right side forward I switched back and started fighting left side forward because 
I've got a real bad bone bruise on my heel a week before the 1966 United States National Championships. So when I went up to fight and won that tournament subsequently in 1966, I fought everybody and beat everybody with my left side forward. So at the time I met Bruce, my fighting stance looked something like this. A low stance, this arm was in front of my rib cage, and I kept my head straight against my opponent. I did a lot of faking, a lot of punching with the front hand, and lots of grabbing and trap with the front hand. And I would work quite a bit off this lead leg sidekick coming in. Sometimes I would grab, come over the top with a punch, or come over the top with a hammer fist. I didn't use a lot of variations of combinations of what have you. Facing straight ahead, my stance looks something like this. Protect my rib cage, I put my elbow in front of that. Protect the groin, I put my fist in front of that. Protect my rib cage, and I stayed here. Somebody went from ahead, I would lean back, step out of range, or just catch him with a defensive sidekick coming in, or beat him to the draw by not letting him get set, or not letting him fly first. So this is where I was when I met Bruce Lee. I was already, uh, the United States national champion. I was already an amateur world champion. And I'd won a num number of major tournaments before he came along. So at this point, I got a master instructor working with a pretty darn good fighter at that time. So Bruce liked my lead off side. I was working a lot of punches with the front hand and I was working a lot of kicks off the front leg. So that's where we started working from the beginning. One of the first things we started to learn was this forward hand strike, which is very popular in the Jeet Kune Do and the uh, Wing Chun styles. Now let me show you the stance that we worked on first of all. He would position me pretty much in a boxer stance.